Another reason exists to enhance the relationship between human rights and environment protection structures. Both are developing a multi-stakeholder approach to discussions and negotiations. States, but also civil society, NGOs, private organizations together have to develop jointly norms as well as programs of work. This approach of multilateralism has to prosper. In practical terms, the concrete implementation of the rights to a healthy environment, as well as the rights to water and sanitation, can only be based on international instruments dedicated to pollution control or waste management. On the subject of pollution, for example, toxic substances and waste management, the triple COP of the Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions, which will be held in Geneva in June 2022, will once again be an opportunity to make concrete and tangible progress in international environmental governance, as well as for the strengthening of instruments that can contribute to guaranteeing a healthier environment over the long term, and therefore the concretization of some basic human rights. Such are the reasons why France is particularly interested in this side event. I thank it once again all its co-organizers and participants, and I look forward to a fruitful and concrete discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Excellency. And moving on with the, the welcoming and introductory remarks, it is our pleasure now to turn to Her Excellency Ambassador Catalina de Vandes, the permanent representative of the Republic of Costa Rica to the United Nations in Geneva. Excellency, over to you. Thank you very much, muchas gracias, and thanks, Excellency, also to our Justice and the Geneva Environment, Environment Network for co-hosting this event uh, with us. And, and of course, thank all of you for joining us in, in this important discussion. As uh, the ambassador has said, uh, France and Costa Rica, we have a, a long-standing collaboration um, through many of the activities that are central to our DNA, as we say, in Costa Rica, and one of them is the High uh, Ambition Coalition uh, for People and the Planet, in which we try to protect the 30% uh, of our biodiversity and sea and in land. And, and we're very pleased to see how um, this coalition is, is gathering support as we speak, and this included the meetings at the CEG in Soal to strengthen uh, stronger commitment towards uh, the coalition. One thing that is in very important for us in Costa Rica, of course, is the, in, in, in relating to this conversation about how can we use the Human Rights Council to move our agenda forward is, of course, the recent developments in the, in the session of the Council uh, 48. Uh, as you all know, last year in the session of September, Costa Rica, together with uh, four other countries, decided to step up and raise the bar of what the Human Rights Council can achieve. We adopted a landmark resolution, 84 uh, slash 13, which recognized the human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, a right that has been in existence for decades and is in fact incorporated into the legal frameworks of more than 155 states. The recognition of this right is now set to be replicated by the UN General Assembly to enhance the breadth of multilateral support in New York. This universal recognition of the human right to a clean, uh, healthy, and sustainable environment has in a way also set the benchmark for this year's joint commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Stockholm Declaration for a Human Environment. And this is something that we have also been discussing with all the civil society groups. Stockholm Plus 50 represents a key moment of reflection for our global community. On what we have achieved, of course, yes, but mainly on our collective failures and how to swiftly enact the urgent transformations that we need. And there are, of course, many beacons to guide our work. We have science, the common good, transparency, and inclusivity. Having people on the planet that on the same level of care and attention, and of course, we have human rights. Resolution 48 slash 13 uh, comes as a, at a critical moment, to, moment in our plight. It is a strong human rights tool to break the barriers that have been preventing the world to achieve large-scale environmental justice. However, what we mostly need is a sound political leadership and honest true commitment supported by enhanced and additional financial resources. This is the key of the question. 
Environmental human rights defenders have shown an impressive leadership and we have to be forever grateful of the brave efforts of women Afro descendants and indigenous leaders across the world who have been standing up against the devastation caused by human action through powerful cooperation and often sadly with the silence of some of our political leaders. But the truth is that environmental human rights defender cannot and should not be left alone to save our lives from the climate, biodiversity, ocean, and pollution crisis. They need our full support, the full support and protection of states. In this light, Costa Rica has respectfully called on all states, but especially on the COP26, COP27 climate change presidency, and also on the COP15 biodiversity presidency, to continue strengthening their leadership, ambition, and commitment with human rights by explicitly incorporating the human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment uh, and beyond a human rights-based approach in all their working documents and statements, in organizing discussion events and promoting the widespread implementation of Resolution 4813 within the perspective, within, I'm sorry, their respective conventions and of crucial importance to pledge significant new financial contributions to the developing world with ease of access and without overburdening their already heavy levels of debt. Lastly, let me assure that uh, the work in Geneva is far from done. Costa Rica will continue untiringly to raise the ambition of the Human Rights Council and the Geneva system. The Council, as a crucial player in the United Nations, has a moral responsibility to engage directly with all the United Nations conventions and programs on environment. Otherwise, it would not be properly fulfilling its mandate, that is, to promote universal respect for the protection of all human rights and fundamental freedoms for all and make recommendations to their implementation. Let me underscore, underscore this last bit. The Council has the mandate to make recommendations. We offer Costa Rica support to present, to pre, I'm sorry, we offer Costa Rica support to present and future members of the Council to discuss and agree on innovative ways in which a rights-based approach can be incorporated into all environmental multilateral fora at global, regional, and national level through the Council's work. Thank you very much, and I hope that we can keep working together to strengthen the Council's contributions to environmental human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Excellency. And moving on with the welcoming and introductory remarks, it's our pleasure to turn to the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, David Boyd. David Boyd um, is not uh, with us. He has uh, recorded a message that uh, my colleagues are going to screen.
Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, moving on and concluding this first part of the event, it's our pleasure to turn to um, our colleague Aruko in New York, who is leading on the preparations for the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. Aruko, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first, I'd like to thank the permanent mission of Costa Rica and France, as well as the Geneva Environment Network and its partners for organizing this Geneva Stockholm Plus 50 dialogues, uh, which is very important for us. Uh, to, to raise awareness and also expand the community of knowledge about the Stockholm Plus 50 and its efforts. I'd also like to thank the panelists who are present today and also for the contribution that has already been made as well as to be made for the rest of the, the session. Uh, my name is Haruko Kusu. Uh, as introduced, I'm acting as the principal coordinator for the Stockholm Plus 50 uh, Secretariat. Um, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about the Stockholm Plus 50 and the preparation that has been made so far. As many of you already know that uh, Stockholm Plus 50 is implemented under the auspices of UNGA Resolution 75-280 and 75-326. Um, and UNEP Executive Director Inger Andersson has been appointed by the Secretary General of the United Nations to act as the Secretary General for International Meetings. And also, the same resolution has designated UNEP to act as the focal point to cooperate and coordinate with other UN agencies and partners for the implementation of this international meeting. 
The theme is about the healthy planet for the prosperity of all, leaving no one behind. Um, as it was, um, as you already know, that this is a co mainly a commemorative event, and it's not expected to have any negotiated outcome. However, this commemorative and non-negotiable nature is also providing an opportunity for us to really look at the progress made in the last 50 years, as well as the challenges uh, that lies ahead from the lessons learned for the last 50 years, and focus on how Stockholm Plus 50 can catalyze action based on negotiated outcomes and processes and commitments that have been made by other multilateral fora, such as the Resolution 48-13, as referred to by Her Excellency the Duchess. Um, we also can use this as a, a stepping stone or jumping board to explore cross-cutting issues such as the linkages between human rights and environment, which are often dealt with under separate silos. And there have been references about breaking silos also, um, and also as uh, His Excellency Bonafont also has mentioned about trying to look at the linkages between human rights and environment that are often overlooked. So it allows us to be bold. We can bring in uncomfortable dialogues, uh, unusual dialogues to the table, and we can be ambitious as well as inclusive and be action-oriented without having to go down to the negotiation table. That is basically the expectation that we have for the Stockholm Plus 50 meeting. There are three organizing principles of engagement. One is about the intergenerational responsibility. Second is to be inclusive in participation and to look for interconnections. Uh, this is interconnections between generations and also between the sectors, and also to look for implementation opportunities. Now, just in terms of the logistics for the June meeting, uh, the meeting is going to be held on the 2nd and 3rd of June in Stockholm. The convocation letter announcing the meeting has been issued earlier this month, and the invitation letters from the Secretary General will be out to the heads of state very soon. The invitation letters from the Secretary General of the International Meeting to other UN agencies and NEA are going out as we speak. The structure of the meeting will consist of a plenary session governed by the, the United Nations General Assembly rules and, and procedures, and uh, what's called the leadership dialogues. There are three leadership dialogues that are creating substantive context to the meeting, as well as a third pillar, which is also as important, which is looking at stakeholder engagement at the national, regional, and different sectoral levels to make sure that this inclusivity and bringing everybody on board is really going to be brought into the mainstream of, of the meeting. Uh, I would also like to inform you that we just completed the preparatory meeting of the Conference 50 this Monday at the UN General Assembly Hall in New York, and you'll be able to follow the proceedings uh, that have been recorded on UN Web TV. Now turning to the theme of this meeting, this particular dialogue, We'd really like to see how to mobilize the human rights communities based in Geneva to join their voices and to put an offer, a commitment, a contribution, proposals, and a dialogue to the Stockholm Plus 50 table. Especially, we believe that the meeting offers an opportunity to explore emerging areas in support of a healthy planet that includes very important areas for your interest which are trying to look at making universal the recently recognized human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, especially in the context of Leadership Dialogue 1, which is looking at reflecting on the urgent need for actions to achieve a healthy planet and prosperity of all, which includes looking at rights-based approaches and effective multilateralism to address intergenerational responsibility and equity. Also in Leadership Dialogue 2, which is about achieving a sustainable and inclusive recovery from COVID-19 pandemic, there has been mentioning of the importance of looking at just and inclusive and sustainable recovery and transitions. So in, in, in a nutshell, we'd really like this community, this audience that we have today, to really explore how the human rights community can really contribute and, and lend its voice and expertise in addressing the overall theme about how we can really cooperate together to approach for a healthy environment for all, for the prosperity of all. I'll stop there. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Aruko, for completing this uh, welcoming and introductory remarks. Um, before we move to the next session of this event, um, I s we see that there are no questions uh, online. We'd like to turn to the room to see if there are questions here in the room. But also, let me add that this event that it hasn't been mentioned yet, that this event is also co-sponsored by the Permanent Mission of Sweden to the United Nations in, the, in Geneva. So I'm moving at the room to see if there are any clarifications that are needed uh, after what Aruko and the other. And as there are no questions, I think we can move to the second part uh, of this event, huh, where we are going to look um, at um, um, interactions between uh, fields. And to, to facilitate this part and moderate this part of the event, it's my uh, pleasure to turn to uh, Islador, who is the representative of Earth Justice uh, here uh, in Geneva who will be uh, um, introducing you the, the next speakers and, and facilitating the session. Thank you very much, Laina. Thank you to, the, uh, to the, all the interventions uh, we have just heard. And uh, indeed, after setting the stage, we'd like to uh, do two focus uh, on how these two fields can be interconnected in the perspective of what Ambassador Bonafon has said about an ecologically oriented human rights-based approach which is perhaps one of the uh, contributions that uh, Geneva can do for the dialogue uh, that are coming in Stockholm, is, as it was just asked. The, the first example and first focus we would like to do is um, to look at the question of preserving biodiversity in ecosystems, because we just finished uh, yesterday here in Geneva uh, the meetings of the subsidy bodies of the C Convention on Biodiversity, which will continue also later in June in, in, in Nairobi. And um, the first speaker, for this uh, issue, on this issue is uh, Mrs. Uh, Jackie Siles, who is the head of human rights in conservation at the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Jackie, this is quite an interesting title that you have uh, for your function. And it shows that actually there has been a reshuffle or a reorganization within IUCN, which follows directly some of the outcomes of the recent World Conservation Congress you held in Marseille. So, um, could you please tell us more about how IUCN now is bridging <laughs> human rights and conservation, and, and what challenges do you see that you could better address by making such a link? The floor is yours, Jackie. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. I have a, a presentation, so maybe uh, I, I, it's on. Is it? Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the organizer for the opportunity to speak with you among such a distinguished uh, guest and ambassador on behalf of IUCN. I thank this panel and co-organizers for recognizing and including IUCN unique voice for this discussion in human rights and the achievement of environmental sustainability. As it was mentioned, I'm Jackie Siles and I'm the acting head of IUCN human rights and conservation team where we work to place emphasis in human rights-based approaches and environmental action. Um, next, please. Am I able to see it? So I don't know if it is on. on. It is on, um, okay, the, the second one, okay. Uh, we all know from Hellland that conservation work can, uh, can uh, at times become an event, a driver of human rights and abuses and we have to continue to work to ensure that all environmental activities safeguard human rights because this failure cannot be part of the way that we protect uh, our planet. Now, uh, not only is, uh, is the right thing to do, but it's essential because we cannot do conservation without protecting and advancing uh, human rights. And the question here is why this is uh, important. And because we are living in an unprecedented times, uh, times where the globe is warming and affecting people's livelihood, times where pandemic jump from animals to human in such an over uh, systems, times where the status quo just won't work anymore because we cannot afford to leave uh, things business as usual. And uh, business as usual for a long time it has include the systematic marginalization of our most vulnerable people, women, girls, and indigenous people bear uh, the burden of marginalization, as well as resulting in equitable and differentiated impact. Not only are these human rights issues that are real for the 
to the equality, but then also undermine our attempts to save the planet. Then he studied in my own experience working for almost 35 years in environmental sector showed that women and indigenous people are also essential contributors to solving the environmental problem. And yet not exactly, and yet uh, for that exactly reason, they are also persecuted for their defense of uh, shared environment, our earth. Next, please. Uh, and why this, and, and this is why the international, uh, the international unit for conservation of nature, we work uh, with the focus of addressing this perception of materialization and exploitation of women and indigenous people with the context of the environmental action. As the Human Resource, uh, Human Health uh, Rights Council uh, conceded last year, we all have the right to a healthy and clean environment and we need to set our uh, protection for those who are not only the most vulnerable, but also the most powerful. And uh, they're the most vulnerable because our system fails to prioritize them and they are the most powerful because they are unique contributors to the progress that benefit all of us through the protection and sustainable management of nature. In today's uh, discussion, I would like to ask how can we work together across the human rights and conservation field to ensure no one is left behind. Next, please. Uh, I can share a little bit about how IUCN is taking these issues on. Today, IUCN is the only uh, international governmental organization that includes indigenous people's organization as a full and effective member. Uh, our most recent work conservation programs are maintained, for example, last year, uh, when the first time that indigenous organization worked as a five members of the assembly, to this space, IUCN become, welcomes IUCN people to create our global conservation priorities because this is an essential step to, re to respect the rights of indigenous peoples. And we are also working with indigenous uh, members to realize their self-determined conservation priorities. And we are also working with them to ensure that biodiversity uh, finances uh, their hands and, uh, and to guide the stewardship of nature. Uh, next, please. How can we uh, um, protect the fences? Uh, we have been working with our commission on environmental, economic, and social policy to highlight the voices of uh, and experience of defenders. Our Congress. For example, passed uh, uh, last year a resolution of protecting environmental human rights defenders, uh, including the link for the first time of a global discussion that recognized the use of gender-based violence as a tactic to silence and suppress women's experience. And more, more is needed to specifically highlight their challenges and to support their work and their safety. Uh, the Human Rights Council resolution of uh, collective right to a healthy clean environment and also its expert report on the situation of indigenous environmental defenders, uh, defenders that very clearly support this. Uh, but uh, we should craft ways to explore how we can advance this together to leverage each other as value for the benefit uh, of defenders. Next, please. In the conservation uh, sector, we have faced the fact that gender responsive approaches will not uh, possible, uh, will not be possible if we do not consider gender safety. As a climate change and environmental degradation working, our living conditions, including our access and ability to manage and benefit from natural resources, so to put social bound breaks down. Resulted tension give rise to a domestic and intimate partner violence with the struggling families to turn to sexual exploitation and even child marriage as a negative coping strategy and response to droughts and climate uh, weather events. And among all these, gender neutral and blind programming can never be work the conditions. 
we have a collective responses to ensure all people have their dignity and take accounting for why we address uh, gender-based violence and victims. Uh, so the flares that you saw is a, is a, is to write a human rights vendor too. We, I want to tell you that we have been working to expose this issue and we, we, we launched uh, our landmark publication in 2020. And since then we have been creating a center to, uh, to support projects, practitioners, and even policy mark, uh, makers to close this, uh, this gap. We are also launching a grant mechanism that this year we support across uh, this, to support this close challenge. And uh, there is much that uh, we can do together, and I wonder how can we work together to prevent gender-based uh, gender violence risk. For all people, we know that when the environment is regulated, this issue really try, try, uh, trigger violence. And um, the last one, I just want, I would like to leave with these uh, reflections and invite you to join our efforts. I also would like to open the door to all of you to explore how our areas of action and government expertise may also strengthen uh, our uh, your human rights work as well. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Mrs. Celeste, for this presentation of how UCN is now really openly working on the issue of, uh, of human rights and, and in conservation. Um, in order to build bridges, you need to build it from both sides. And after seeing how precisely IUCN is now integrating the human rights issues, let's turn to the Human Rights Council and more precisely to one of its special procedures. Of course, we all know the work which has been done and we just heard it uh, by the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. But unfortunately, sometimes we don't pay enough attention to some other mandates which are not directly in the field of environment, but do say a lot about this link between human rights and the environment. Now, Professor Pedro Arrojo Agudo, uh, thank you very much for being with us. You are the, special, the, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights to Safe Drinking, Water and Sanitation. And in your report, you have mentioned more than once the necessity to look at the hydrolog hydrological cycles and also to have an integrated water resource management approach, which is something very well already rooted in the profession. Could you tell us more um, how do you see that ecosystemic approaches can strengthen the protection of the rights that you are uh, scrutinizing and monitoring, and how uh, these challenges can be better approached by doing such a link? Uh, the floor is yours. Well, uh, excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear friends, first of all, gracias, muchas gracias, merci, vraiment merci, uh, thank you uh, for your invitation. It, it's, a, it's a great honor for me. Um, well, since uh, I took office a year ago, I have always insisted that we are facing a particularly paradoxical crisis. The global water crisis and the water planet, the blue planet, with two billion people with a guaranteed access to safe drinking water. But I always insist that although in many arid territories, Climate change uh, may make them inevitable due to a physical lack uh, of water. Most of these two billion people are not properly thirsty people without water uh, in their living environment. Uh, but impoverished people living next to polluted rivers or aquifers, and increasingly polluted by toxic substances uh, such as pesticides, from industrial agriculture uh, or each charges from uh, uh, mining and industry. This is why I insist that uh, this global water crisis in the world is rooted in the confluence of two structural uh, major flaws in our way uh, of life and development. The flow of inequity and poverty that we have generated from profoundly unjust and immoral socioeconomic systems and on the other hand, the flow of unsustainability that we have provoked in our aquatic ecosystems, turning water from being the key factor of life into the most terrible vector of disease and death that humanity has ever known. On the basis of this diagnosis, there 
two uh, axes on which I propose to focus our efforts. The first one is making peace with our rivers, wetlands, lakes, and aquifers. If we do not restore the health and functionality of these of the rivers, wetlands, and aquifers on which the daily water supply of these two billion people, impoverished people, depends, we will not make real progress on SDG 6. To this end, it is necessary to move from managing water as a simple resource to ecosystem management based on paradigm of sustainability. Rivers can no longer be managed as a water channels, but as living ecosystems. And on the other hand, second, promoting democratic governance of water as a common good from a human rights based approach. The challenge we face with this uh, global water crisis is not, it's not a business opportunity, but a democratic and ethical challenge. I believe that an ethical reflection on the values and functions of water is uh, necessary. On the basis of this reflection, I propose uh, to distinguish the following ethical categories that should be used to prioritize the different uses and functions of water. First of all, water for life. Second, water for public interest uses. Third, but third, not first, water for economic development. And even, I, I used to talk about water uses that threaten life. And I usually talk even in a provocative way on water crime. <coughs> Focusing on water for life in the uses of, and functions of water as uh, a life support system, both for humans and for the biodiversity of which we are a part. The minimum amount to guarantee the drinking water and sanitation services necessary for a dignified life as a human right is water for life. Water to produce the food needed by vulnerable communities linked to the human right to food. That is also water for life. And water flows and, uh, and quality necessary to ensure the sustainability of aquatic ecosystems linked to the human right to a healthy environment recently recognized by the UN. Also, that is also water for life. And it's very important to understand that arguing scarcity in the water for life space is just unacceptable because water for life uses and functions must be guaranteed as a priority. We need to build democratic governance based on these ethical priorities. We need to build a sustainable and democratic water governance from a human rights based approach. But uh, for this, market logic is not the right tool. Uh, and I'm not against the free market. I, I used to insist that I'm against using the market to manage values that the market does not understand and does not know how to manage. In Spain, we have a motto that says, no hay que pedir peras un olmo. Uh, that means, uh, don't ask peers from uh, an elm tree. If you want peers, look for them uh, in, in peer tree. No. Well, advancing in the universal fulfillment of the human right to safe drinking water and sanitation, uh, that is meeting SDG 6, on the one hand, and advancing in recovering and conserving the good ecological status and health of our aquatic ecosystem are, uh, and above all, in the current climate change outlook, recovering the good state of our underground aquifers as uh, they are the water lungs of nature, are converging challenges. I call all of you to take profit from the next World Water Conference in New York in 2023 by developing joint strategies to restore the good uh, state of rivers, aquifers, wetlands, and aquatic ecosystems in general as an essential key in advancing in compliance with SDG 6. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, uh, for your contribution. and. Uh,
Uh, thank you for mentioning the question of the right to food, because this gives me the opportunity to, uh, to, to note that the special rapporteur on the right to food, Professor Bakri, is also making a very strong link between uh, food systems and the ecosystems where they are being developed. Uh, so indeed, there is a lot to, to do in, in this field. And I'm sure that the, the, question, the, the, the formulation you have just uh, done about peace with rivers is something that has a strong echo in IUCN. I look forward to the exchanges we can have uh, when we get to the, to the Q&A in, in a few minutes. You also mentioned how the question of uh, pollutions in rivers and, uh, and toxic uh, substances we can find in rivers is a huge challenge for the right to water and sanitation. Well, let's turn now precisely on how we can push the efforts to reverse this, the toxic tide, which still is dominating uh, our planet. And so for this, we have two uh, uh, speakers with us. Mr. Rolf Payet, who is the Executive Secretary of the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions. as one of the conventions who have a, a synergy and a, and a common joint uh, secretariat. And actually, as uh, the Ambassador of France has just said, uh, the these three conventions that we call the BRS conventions will meet soon in Geneva uh, in June. So um, there have been already in the field of uh, reversing the toxic tide a number of opportunities to have exchanges uh, between the Human Rights Council bodies and the uh, convention, the MEAs. So Rolf, in the work that you have uh, been doing until now, how do you see this uh, relationship with the human rights bodies and their publication and their work? Ralph, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yves, and Excellencies, and colleagues. Uh, very good afternoon, uh, evening, and morning to you all. Indeed, we have been working uh, really very closely with the reporters and, of course, uh, the Council as well, as well as the UN organization. And in fact, in one of our COPs uh, four years ago, we had the deputy of the Human Rights Crisis Council addressing our COPs, uh, which blends the importance that we give to the issue of human rights in relation to chemicals and waste, but also in creating awareness among our parties and observers on the issue of human rights. In terms of human rights, when it comes to chemicals, as you know, um, it's, it's uh, principle one of the Stockholm Convention actually prescribes the right to life. That's saying that man has the fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life in an environment of a quality that permits a life of dignity and well-being. And uh, in fact, we also have a very, very, very close, in, in fact, uh, as close as you can get in terms of human rights is the right to health. The right to health is an inclusive right. It extends not only to timely and appropriate health care, but also to the underlying determinants of good health, such as occupational health, but also environmental conditions, such as the quality of food, quality of the air, quality of the soil, quality of the oceans, and, uh, and, and the quality of the soil as well. And the Sokong Convention in particular focuses on protecting vulnerable groups, and these include uh, children, fetuses, infants, and also women. And as you probably all know, and heard me before, uh, the chemicals that fall under the Stockholm Convention is designed to protect those vulnerable groups from the impacts of those chemicals, which can cause cancer, can cause deformities, can cause delayed development, and a host of other uh, health impacts. And what we've seen is that uh, in many countries, uh, women are still expected to perform the bulk of the domestic work where they are exposed to indoor air pollution, but also the management of waste, which includes uh, the burning of plastics and other types of household goods. We also see in farming, 40% of agricultural work in developing countries is done by women and girls, and because girls and women are most likely to be illiterate as men, they are in the front lines, and as such, they are affected by the overuse and abuse of pesticides, which is, as you know, regulated under the Rotterdam Convention and some of the pesticides which are seriously hazardous under the Stockholm Convention. There's also the issue of cultural norms that also impact on women and girls' vulnerabilities, and we have an estimated 13,000 chemicals used in beauty and hygiene products. 
and only about 10% have been evaluated for safety, and some of those are linked to some of the health issues I've talked about before. We also have, uh, for example, the Inuit community in the Arctic that depends on marine mammals, seals, whales, and other mammals for very much of their livelihoods. And as you probably also know, long-range transport of many of these chemicals is accumulating in some of these species, and as a result, is being transferred into the human body or humans or the com those communities that are dependent upon those species. This new right to a clean and healthy and sustainable environment, I can refer to different uh, decisions of our COPs, but also decisions of the UN and other MEAs that we work with. But uh, when it comes to the right to clean water and sanitation, um, we also need to focus on the issue of pollution of, of, of clean water, of clean water, of water. And, and in terms of chemicals uh, that are in this water, not only uh, human pollution as a result of sewage uh, or pollution from pesticides, but from the chemicals that we use that go through our washing machines, such as microplastics and a number of other chemicals coming from detergents and other products that we use in the home, all these contribute to, to water pollution. The right to adequate food is also a very important area of work, especially with the Rotterdam Convention, where we work with the Food and Agriculture Administration, FAO, in order to ensure the safe and sound use of pesticides. And here, the Rotterdam Convention lists at least 33 pesticides, of which a number are highly hazardous pesticides. And it calls upon countries to put in place measures and controls to ensure appropriate and safe use of those chemicals in light of the importance of having access to food and, of course, healthy and good food. The right to adequate housing is also an important area, especially, as I mentioned before, in the pollution, the kind of substances and products that we use in construction. Um, as you know, the, the uh, Rotterdam Convention has been negotiating for many years to list uh, asbestos. Asbestos is still affecting several populations around the world. We're still striving and urging parties to list asbestos and to reduce exposure of asbestos to communities, especially in housing and other uses of asbestos. Now, we work very closely with the special reporters. We would have liked to work uh, with the other reporters, for example, the reporter of water and sanitation. And, and I think uh, one of my suggestions is also the reporters need to get together, talk together. I think I've heard about the word of silos, I've heard about the word of gaps. And I think together by working with those special reporters, it can help us to identify the gaps, identify also the synergies and the opportunities, and so that we can advance this discussion forward. So my last sentence is that when we look at chemicals and waste, it touches on a wide range of human rights issues. And I hope I've given you just an insight on this wide range of, of HR issues that uh, chemicals and waste are related to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ralph. And indeed, uh, it's an interesting uh, list of interesting examples you provide to us about how the, uh, the work that you are doing actually also contributes to the protection of, uh, of human rights. And as you said, uh, the special rapporteur on uh, on toxic and human rights. Uh, you have worked with uh, the previous mandate holder and the current mandate holder, and we have the privilege to have Marcus Orellana with us uh, today. Thank you, Professor Orellana, to be with us. Um, you are going to address uh, the next uh, meeting of the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm conventions. Um, how do you see precisely in this context uh, the contribution that human rights procedures can bring to this work? The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much, Yves, and thank you for the organizers uh, for, uh, to invite me to speak today um, on this issue of, uh, of the engagement between the Human Rights Council and the Special Procedures and the Toxics and Wastes Cluster Instruments. Uh, I, I wish to start by pointing out that there has been engagement, and this engagement has been constructive and productive, and I would wish to give a couple examples. 
The, the Human Rights Council in the resolution adopted in October 2020 that renewed the toxics and, and human rights mandate, it placed emphasis on the information regarding, and I quote, developments, gaps, and shortcomings in the effectiveness of international regulatory mechanisms concerning hazardous substances and wastes. The, similarly, the Human Rights Council resolution in October 2021 that has been uh, mentioned that recognizes for the first time at the global level the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment puts emphasis also on, on the, it affirms that the promotion of this right requires the full implementation of multilateral environmental agreements. And so here we again see a linkage. I also want to recall and reflect that this resolution and this global recognition is a watershed moment in international uh, policy making, in the interaction between human rights and the environment that finds its inception in the Stockholm 1972 conference. We should not forget, looking at the preparatory works of that conference, that human rights supports the conceptual narrative and foundation of the Stockholm Declaration. This we can see in the proclamation, in the principles, in the language used, and also, as I mentioned in the preparatory works, was heated debates on several issues, but not on the human rights issues. And so there's a lot on which we can build, and our generation, in that sense, is harvesting what others, with their foresight, had the vision to plant. In addition to these resolutions, there have been several thematic reports that have engaged the collaboration between the uh, toxics and waste instruments and human rights. For example, the report on plastics and human rights that I presented to the General Assembly last year analyzes how the Basel Convention, the Stockholm Convention, are addressing plastics. Uh, similarly, the thematic reports on the right, report on the right to science engages the issue of science policy interface platforms and it looks in detail at how the Rotterdam Convention is failing to transform the recommendations of its scientific committee into actual measures. So the COP is failing to act on the scientific advice. This is an agenda item that will come live in the meeting of BRS that has been mentioned, scheduled for uh, early June, coming June. And then a third example of a thematic report is the report that has been recently presented by uh, Professor David Boyd to the Council on the right to live in a non-toxic environment as, the, as an element of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. This report already expresses Rolf's suggestion of collaboration, of working together. This is a report that uh, David and I work together closely, and it identifies multilateral environmental agreements in the toxics and waste cluster as good practices. But of course, there are implementations and compliance issues that remain challenges. And this is the second point that I'd like to highlight. MEAs have, for the most, compliance mechanisms. The, if we look back, the Montreal Protocol uh, opened the door to these mechanisms that were modeled after the human rights oversight mechanisms. But these mechanisms in MEAs lack the possibility for individuals, for NGOs, for civil society to present communications to these mechanisms, to trigger uh, investigations of compliance. And that's where uh, the role of the mandate uh, acts in a way as a, as a proxy, because the mandate does receive often voluminous information regarding lack of compliance with MEAs. Now, these mechanisms are really important because they allow for the focus on attention. What are the issues that are urgent, that call for the greatest attention? In Basel, for example, is it implementation of the plastic amendment? Is it ongoing cases of illegal traffic of wastes? Uh, the, the example of the shipment of more than 200 containers of wastes from Italy to Tunisia comes to mind. And so this issue of compliance certainly remains 
uh, an open question, and a rights-based approach would call for reform of these compliance mechanisms so that they can incorporate the opportunity for individuals and civil society to present communications. A third point that I wish to make is echoing what Rolf has, ma has mentioned, uh, the collaboration between the special procedures, uh, my predecessor, myself, and uh, the BRS conventions. Messages at BRS COPs, for example, the opportunity to speak at the previous COPs, the expectation that that uh, collaboration will continue, but also collaboration on capacity building initiatives, the opportunity I've had to work closely with the Secretariat, uh, for example, on Rotterdam, on webinars and other initiatives on pesticides and human rights. To begin to uh, conclude, let me point out a couple of things. Engagement between the special procedures of the council and the council and BRS and more generally the toxics and wastes cluster is needed today more than ever. Because the human face to exposure to toxics reminds us that these problems are not abstractions. They have real world implications for real people. And despite that, the International Conference on Chemicals Management, whose fifth session is yet to be scheduled, but is critical to designing the post-2020 approach globally, is still resisting explicit human rights language. If the vision of the post-2020 is not aligned with human rights, we see a mismatch that can uh, produce a repeat of the failed global 2020 goal uh, the international community not having met the uh, goal articulated about 20 years ago in the Johannesburg summit. And we see something similar in Basel, Rotterdam, Stockholm, and Minamata, which often resist explicit human rights language. There are good seats upon which to build, but for example, there are certain gaps in Basel that perpetuate the north-south transfer of e-wastes that expose migrant workers, informal workers to the hazardous chemicals in these waste streams. Similarly, we see limitations in the Minamata Convention that allow for small-scale gold mining to continue to contaminate the bodies of indigenous peoples that have nothing to do with mining, and shortcomings in the Rotterdam Convention that do not tackle the export of pesticides that are prohibited for health and environmental reasons in their countries of origin. Solutions to these problems are legitimate and effective when anchored in human rights, when anchored in a human rights-based approach, transparency, participation, accountability. We have a good foundation to build upon, but we still have much, much to do to reverse the toxic tide. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Elena, for your contribution. Um, actually, it, it also highlights, and I could just add in, in some of the reflection that we could have in thinking about this 50th anniversary after the Stockholm Declaration of 1972, uh, some improvements which have done at the regional level. I'm thinking here about the ORUS Convention for the Environmental Procedural Rights, which has imported, actually, its compliance mechanism. Although it is a multilateral environmental agreement, it has imported its uh, compliance mechanism from the human rights system, which is exactly the same thing which happened with the Escazú agreement, uh, which was adopted in, in, in Costa Rica, and the Escazú agreement is going to have its first meeting of the parties, if I'm right, in about a month or so. So, uh, indeed, it's a very interesting progress, and I think you are proposing here a very interesting uh, food for thoughts uh, for this anniversary of how more can be done in the compliance of the, in the field of uh, the environment by using the human rights mechanism directly or indirectly and making these connections and articulations. Having said, said that, um, let me turn now to the questions and answers and I, I'll turn back to, uh, uh, to Diana to see if we have received any questions to the different, uh, to the different speakers. Sorry. <laughs> 
Yeah. He said okay, and then he. So. Um, and there's a there's a question in the room. Please. So let's start yes. by the question in the room. And thank you very much, everyone. And it's uh, Federica Donati from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I just have a, a question um, in relation to what, what, what is the strategy around the recognition of the right to a healthy environment in New York? As uh, Phil mentioned, it would be good to have the General Assembly to have it recognized as well. But we heard from, uh, from David Boyd that uh, actually just now the Commission on Status of Women has concluded its work. And uh, the, what is uh, the text of the agreed conclusion doesn't go as far as what we would have wished it to go. So what, what would be the strategy and what would be the timeline around that? Thanks very much. <laughs> but thank you very much, uh, Federica, for that question. And indeed, um, initially that was a consideration of, uh, and of course this is part of our our delegations and the delegations of the core group uh, comprised by uh, Slovenia, Maldives, and Morocco, and Costa Rica are um, now working on in New York. Initially, there was conversations about the Commission of Status of Women and, and how to perhaps um, channel the idea of the recognition in a resolution there. But uh, it was later considered that it was better to have standing alone resolution that uh, in principle um, is currently being uh, drafted. I don't have, and uh, we don't have the exact dates or a timeline for that, uh, but what I can tell you is that the idea was to work towards the, this year before the PGA of Maldives ends, so that it could also be an opportunity for the core group of using the spaces that we have uh, to, to do it. Uh, the commitment is there. Uh, we are counting on the support of all member states as we have here. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, you know, uh, this, we, we doubt that we are gonna have a bigger opposition than the one that we have here, but it's always a, a, a question mark and then we call on all states to support it. It's not and I think one thing that is important is that the recognition was made by the council and we don't want to uh, reopen that conversation. So the General Assembly resolution should take this conversation a step forward uh, in discussing more about how the states would like to translate the, the resolution into, into policy, into practice, whether the General Assembly wants to send some uh, beacons on implementation or, or policies, but um, hopefully, and, and the idea is that the Council had the mandate to do it, the Council did it, and what we are doing is just moving the conversation ahead, but not uh, reinforcing the, the notion of the recognition that was already uh, made uh, here, here in Geneva. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, answer on the coming challenges which, uh, which are coming. I wanted also to ask to the different uh, contributors to this, uh, to this very, very rich discussion if there was also some questions you would like to, to ask to each other, uh, any elements you would like to answer before then we go in, in a few minutes because I know that the ambassadors have also to return to the session of the Human Rights Council which is sitting uh, right now. And so, um, yeah, I don't know if uh, Professor uh, the special rapporteur on, on, on the right to water and sanitation uh, wanted perhaps to react as uh, some issues have been said, I'm, I'm thinking about what uh, Rob Fayer has said about the VRS and that that is concerned by, by the, the pollution of the rivers and, and the water. Um, the floor is yours if ever you want to take uh, and, and say a few words about that. Well, um, no, I, I understood the question before uh, about New York. I don't know if uh, the person has uh, uh, raised this question uh, is uh, want to express uh, the question I will talk about. Uh, New York opted uh, for a nature-based strategy uh, for uh, guaranteeing uh, safe drinking water for their citizens, and it was a nature-based strategy uh, through a socio-economic agreement with the farmers. Uh, you know, in the in the in the basing 
in the water basin uh, in order to avoid contamination. Uh, this strategy was uh, profitable for uh, the, the rural communities uh, upstream, but it was the cheapest way of uh, having uh, safe drinking water, high quality water for the citizens living in New York. I think it's a good, it's a good example. Thank you very much. Um, also, one question uh, which has been raised concerns the uh, concerns the uh, what, what is going to happen in Stockholm uh, in uh, in June, and uh, of course, as it was said, this will not be a negotiated outcome. It's a commemoration. But what are the perspectives, and that could be one of the questions also to ask to all of our panelists uh, and to do a, a, a last round of, uh, of, uh, of comments, what are the contributions you could see coming uh, from the dialogue that will happen in, the, in Stockholm and that could contribute to the different linkages that we have seen right now today in this discussion? Because we see there's a number of bridges and a general overview and taking a stock taking of what has been done over the 50 years and identifying the challenges could be a very good opportunity precisely to, to identify these elements and, and to have elements to, to go forward. So I don't know if uh, Ambassador uh, Bonapont, would you like perhaps to um, start and, and say what you, you, you would see as possibilities of discussions in Stockholm or perhaps beyond or in other fora, if you think perhaps other fora might be more appropriate for that. Thank you very much. The, the, the first remark I would say to your very uh, important question is that um, if we want to act in a pragmatic manner, we have to act based on science, knowledge, and awareness. As long as you don't know the consequences of what you do to the environment or to other human beings, you cannot be taken as accountable for it. But the day you know, you are accountable. Because then you know, knowing what you are doing. And therefore, I think that the science-based approach, which is the root base of the environmental work, has consequences on what we can say about the link between environmental policies and human rights. So number one, science-based. Number two, there is the question of human rights defenders, which has been uh, uh, tackled by uh, some of uh, the panelists. It's extremely important, and I was interested in a panel yesterday to, on human rights defenders and arbitrary detentions to listen to the Hungarian member of uh, the panel saying that environmental activists are more and more attacked, same as human rights defenders. And therefore, there is a natural alliance between those two activities communities, human rights defenders and uh, environmental defenders. And this also is something we have to talk about. How do you protect human rights defenders as well as uh, those, uh, those uh, uh, sorry, uh, environmental activists as well as human rights defenders? And the third one is how do you actively and concretely introduce human rights considerations in the environment's and uh, environmental considerations in the human rights law. And here, the different panelists were underlining the fact that in some instruments, it is already done. In other instruments, there is a reluctance to do it. And we find here the same logic as in the WTO, for example, where human rights considerations are extremely difficult to uh, import, if I may say so, whereas it is very necessary when it comes to boundary measure or uh, things like that. And therefore, I think that the, 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 the key word here has been uh, mentioned by several uh, interlocutors. The key word is working together and is synergy and is broadening a little bit the scope, whether it be in Stockholm Plus 50 or in the Human Rights Council, to be aware that what we are doing in one uh, body is not distinct from what we are doing in another body. And that if we put links between all these things, we have the right approach, whereas if we uh, keep compartmentalizing the work, institution by institution, treaty by treaty, then we miss our task. Thank you.
you very much on that. I am sure what you said also about uh, the science-based approach resonated uh, by, uh, with, with uh, uh, Orellana in his last report to the Council on, on this issue. And it's interesting to see that it's probably going to be a document that can be used in the work for the future uh, new panel at the follow-up of the UNEA uh, decision in, in Nairobi. So this is also another place of, of collaboration. Um, let me turn now to you, uh, Ambassador Devandas. Uh, <laughs> And precisely when, uh, I mean, I don't know if you want to, to react on some of these elements and, and also how, in co because you, you have a long, in Costa Rica, you have a long tradition, as it was said pre previously, of uh, being involved in the field of environment, in the field of human rights. Actually, it's not totally a, a coincidence if uh, the Escazo Agreement has this name uh, for the region. So, um, how do you see this Stockholm, uh, of this port, the opportunity of Stockholm, and, and, and do you see a bit the same question as I asked with the Ambassador of France, uh, perhaps other fora or specific initiatives that could help and, and strengthen these linkages between the two fields? Well, thank you, thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity again, and I think, I mean, for us, there is no separation between the two fields, and, and frankly speaking, I think that everything that we do in environment has to be human rights based, and this is this is part of the of the fundamental, I think, perspective that we have to have. The second point is, I think that, and, and some of the panelists said, we, we cannot afford to lose any opportunity. Every single uh, fora that we have uh, in the coming processes or in the coming discussions, either here in New York and Nairobi or in any um, of the of the upcoming COPs, it, it's a fundamental space to advance in the solution that we have to provide to the three environmental crises that we are facing. In those crises, then, we have to act not in silos and coordination based on science, but also we really need to increase the level of ambition and commitment. And, and, and we cannot do that unless we walk the talk. If we start actually implementing, putting the finances where they should be, making the right priority, making sure that we also um, act in a critical way. I think that Costa Rica, for instance, has a, a very good record, but when I was listening to the uh, presentation of, of uh, the use of chemicals, I reflect on, on the challenges that my own country has uh, with the use of chemicals and how we need to revise um, <coughs> some of those, of those practices. So it's, it's raising the awareness, but it's also, I think at this point, we cannot afford not to have the leadership. So whether it's a Stockholm, whether it's the next uh, um, first conference that should take part is the West Casu, we need to use every single opportunity to remind ourselves that without being uh, androcentric, that human rights-based approach are needed to solve the crisis that we have ahead of us. And, and, and thanking you for the opportunity, because I think that the discussions on what the Geneva-based and especially the human rights responses can contribute is still pending. We are still very far away from actually integrating all the human rights machinery in the right way to the discussion on, on, on the environment. I cannot, and I, and I understand what you said, but in my mind, it's, it's a little bit complicated to, to, to acknowledge that we have to still separate uh, environmental defenders from human rights defenders. We, we really cannot afford to do that anymore. We have the mechanisms to defend and to promote and hopefully to avoid the, uh, the dreadful consequences that many of the defenders of the environment are, are facing around the world. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And this gives me the opportunity to, 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 to note that the, uh, our co-sponsors, Sweden, uh, organized an event on environmental defenders at the beginning of this session of the Human Rights Council in support of the work which is done, yes, in, right, exactly, <laughs> in which, uh, in support of the, the work which is done by Norway, who has been promoting uh, the resolution uh, 4011 on the protection of environmental defenders that was adopted uh, without a vote at the Human Rights Council. And I think this needs to be repeated because it shows how uh, seriously it has been taken by the council uh, to, 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 to strengthen the protection of, of environmental defenders. Uh, you mentioned the question of chemical uh, waste uh, discussion that you have in your own country and, and chemical substances in, in general. And I think uh, Marcos Orellana wanted to intervene also in, uh, in the discussion. And after, I will also uh, give the floor to Haruko. Uh, you probably will have a 
uh, some comments also to um, to add to what you are saying uh, here right now. Uh, Professor Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eve. Uh, I wanted to offer some thoughts on two questions that have been raised. One is on the upcoming conference, the first conference of the parties of the Escazú Agreement, because as you rightly pointed out, this is an opportunity to continue to make progress in the implementation of the rights in the health environment. Let's recall that that agreement commits the parties to guarantee this right. It is not just in the preamble, a supportatory language, but there is an actual obligation to guarantee the right and the uh, articulation of the various elements of procedural elements of that right, access rights to information, participation, justice, and environmental defenders give expression to that. I did want to observe that in the pre-COP that took place a couple of weeks ago, uh, the proposal prepared by uh, Costa Rica, Santa Lucia, Uruguay, and Panama on uh, rules of procedure for the compliance committee for that agreement uh, takes stock of what could be described as best practice, not just good practices, but the best practices in compliance committee throughout the landscape of human rights and environment. So they incorporate individual communications, they incorporate general comments, country visits, other tools. Uh, this proposal was very warmly received at the pre-COP and it provides a strong basis for the ESCASU agreement to uh, serve as a model and guidance for the further developments in the, in the uh, policy and law in this area. That's the first point I, I, I wanted to remark. And the second, what you mentioned, Eve, on Stockholm Plus 50 coming up and messages from the human rights uh, community. Uh, one is that we often hear that the narrative of Stockholm, of the focus on human environment, is stale and has been replaced by the sustainable development paradigm. And I want to challenge that understanding or, or a thesis because if we look at the preparatory works of uh, Stockholm Plus 50, we see already the integration between environment and development. Th this point was presented forcefully by uh, Maurice Strong in the conference itself. So the sustainable development paradigm does not replace Stockholm. It builds on, it finds its seat in Stockholm. It would not exist without Stockholm plus 50. And as I was mentioning earlier, and I want to reiterate, human rights were not absent in Stockholm. They were present and they served as the, found, the conceptual foundation of the narrative, the declaration that resulted from that conference. And so there's an opportunity to continue to build under the sustainable development paradigm and under that conceptual foundation, the integration between human rights and the environment uh, uh, and all of this and uh, uh, under the umbrella of the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Renata. And uh, before I turn to you, as I promised, uh, I, will go, I, I will now give the floor to Egypt who have also asked for the floor. Egypt, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for very much, um, Eve, and uh, thank you to all of the speakers at this event and to the organizers. It's really been very informative and very interesting. Um, we just wanted to really um, make a couple of, of points. First, to um, thank very much the Special Rapporteurs on Human Rights and the Environment on Unsafe Drinking Water and Sanitation for their very important <coughs> remarks, and uh, in particular what they uh, mentioned about the importance of ecologically oriented approaches um, approaches based on ecosystem management, and uh, and we, we really welcome very much um, the words of the Special Rapporteur on Safe Drinking Water and Sanitation regarding the upcoming um, uh, meeting on the review of SDG 6, um, the comprehensive uh, review conference taking place in New York in May 2023, and invite all stakeholders, including, uh, of course, the Special Rapporteurs, to um, submit their views to this review in order to make sure we have a, a really comprehensive way of discussing uh, human rights related to water and how they relate to SDG 6 and SDG 6 implementation. Um, since 2010, the Council has been engaged on the issue of safe drinking water and sanitation, uh, but we really feel we need to take this a step further and a step forward to look at how to, uh, we can have a more uh, comprehensive way to address SDG 6 beyond safe drinking water and sanitation. 
Um, so, so first, uh, just to emphasize this point, and then uh, secondly, um, since there, there has been a, a bit of a mention of uh, the climate change uh, discussions in COP27, uh, just to very briefly mention that um, as president of COP27, Egypt um, is very keen to have a very inclusive approach, uh, to have an approach that um, addresses um, particular uh, vulnerabilities and, and uh, uh, persons uh, uh, that are particularly vulnerable to climate change. Um, and this is why we have really talked about this being a COP for Africa and a COP for implementation. Um, and um, we are uh, engaged with a series, uh, in a series of dialogues with a number of organizations here in Geneva, particularly those working in the humanitarian sector, um, to look at how climate change um, is uh, uh, um, intersecting with humanitarian crises and how we can have a, a, a reasonable and uh, balanced focus on those um, that are, are most vulnerable to that should not be left behind. Um, Oops, I'm afraid we've lost you. Um, I don't know if we can, I hope this was really your concluding words uh, because <laughs> it was very clear actually and, uh, and thank you very much for your contribution. Indeed, Egypt has a, a huge challenge with the uh, COP27 and we're looking forward to uh, uh, to your chairmanship of this important event and it, it's very important to hear that you want this to be very inclusive and indeed it will be uh, the, uh, the COP for Africa, you're, you're very right, this will be a very important uh, moment. Uh, I've promised several times and so now I will give you the floor Haruko and this will be the final remark of, uh, of, for this event as we are getting to the end of the, uh, of the time that was allocated for our discussion. So Haruko the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and, and thank you very much for this very uh, rich discussion and, and commentaries that, that uh, we have seen in this last hour and a half. Uh, I very much agree, first of all, with Mr. Oriana's uh, comments about Stockholm, sustainable development, and human rights approaches being mutually supportive to each other. And if this has started to grow apart in the last 50 years, Stockholm Plus 50 is the time to hammer this again home, to say that these are mutually supportive, and to show in what way they can be implemented in a mutually supportive manner. Uh, especially looking at what does rights-based approach to achieving a healthy planet mean? What does just transition mean? And, and what uh, just transition for jobs and skills mean to us? What does equity mean? Especially for involving youth, women, and indigenous communities as agents of change rather than just vulnerable communities that we need to take care of. So I think these are the points that we'd very much like to hear, again, at Stockholm Plus 50, from your expertise and your standpoint. Uh, in terms of the, perhaps the practicalities, uh, I'd like to encourage uh, you to be involved in the leadership dialogue. As I said, there are three themes to that. And there are actually informal working groups that are meeting to discuss about key messages and recommendations for actions that will be tabled in Stockholm. Uh, the next leadership, sorry, informal working group meetings will happen in probably mid to late April, and also another one in mid May before the June meeting. So I very much encourage you to check the website to uh, subscribe yourself for these uh, informal working groups. Also, I would like to encourage you direct to register for the actual meeting, which is going to open in the next couple of weeks, and also to consider looking for side events, special events, or associated events such as this one, to really promote this work and, and to see how we can bring human rights issues as a main pillar for the Stockholm Plus 50 discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eroko. And this uh, brings us to an end of this part of the, uh, of the dialogue. I will turn now to, uh, to Diana back for the very final uh, closing and, and thanking her and her teams and also for uh, uh, compensating the failure of my own device, which didn't broke the, uh, the event. So uh, once again, a, a lot of thanks to the work which is done by the Geneva Environmental Network. There's a lot of work behind the scenes we don't see which make this possible. And I really want to thank you, Diana, and the whole of your team for that. Thank you very much, uh, Eve. Uh, and we want to thank uh, uh, all the panelists uh, who were with us uh, here in the room, uh, the attendees in the room who made the effort to come back. Uh, we need to come back to, to, to uh, the, the post-COVID area and we don't know yet how it's going to look but it looks like we have uh, more, still more people online than people in the room. We want to thank all the attendees that join us uh, online and of course the panelists 
who were also with us uh, online. Um, and, and also, many people will watch the video afterwards. Geneva is very busy, as you, you, you both mentioned, um, um, with delegates following many, uh, many topics, and who come get back also regularly to the website to watch uh, the discussions um, uh, we are having here. Uh, and with that, um, so just closing this event and, and bring to attention maybe a, a few other discussions that we are having uh, here next week. We are discussing, uh, going back discussing plastic in the run-up to, uh, to, to, to uh, 2024 with, with two events. One, uh, a side event to the UN Economic Commission for Europe uh, uh, Regional Forum on, on, on the Sustainable Development Goals. And that event will, will address microplastics. And another event uh, at the Graduate Institute, which will look at uh, uh, the postionnaire and what uh, uh, the legally binding agreement uh, we have all uh, decided to, to, to work on uh, will look at. And then, of course, we have our update. Uh, you, you have uh, the, the special rapporteur on, on, on uh, human rights and climate change will be, uh, um, the, the name of the special rapporteur will be unveiled uh, this week, decided and approved by the, the Human Rights Council this week. Um, so a few uh, uh, elements on what was discussed <coughs> with in relation to the environment at this session of the Human Rights Council is available on the update that is regularly updated with all the partners in Geneva that work on human rights and environmental related issues. And I think I think I stop here. Thank you all. Merci beaucoup. Merci. 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 Merci.